Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. The good news is it's currently not 40 degrees Celsius here, so I can make this news corner, I guess, without as much trouble as last week. And the extra good news is there is a range of interesting topics to cover this week, so let's kick things off with a couple of Intel stories. First up is the official launch of the Xeon W3175X, Intel's monster 28-core workstation CPU. This chip was first announced sort of at Computex last year, and it's finally here packing a 3.1 gigahertz base clock, a maximum 4.5 gigahertz turbo clock, it has 44 lanes of PCIe 3.0, and a 255 watt TDP. It requires an LGA3647 motherboard like the ASUS Dominus Extreme, along with a huge power supply and six channel memory. Reviews for this CPU went live a couple of days ago. Unfortunately, we didn't get sampled one, and it's unlikely we will, but the good news is a number of other outlets did, and you should go read their reviews if you are interested. There's really not a whole lot that's unexpected here. It's the usual story for a high core count CPU. If you have a workload that can make use of the extra cores, performance is up to 50% better than the Core i9-9980XE, though of course in a lot of workloads you won't see performance at that level. The chip is also unlocked and can be overclocked, though it uses a lot of power when you do so, so you need a good power supply for that sort of thing. Perhaps the most surprising aspect was the final price Intel settled on, which was $2,999. This is their most expensive workstation CPU, but early rumors were suggesting a price closer to $4,500. That said, $3,000 is about as high as Intel could have realistically priced this CPU, considering the 18-core 9980XE is about $2,000 and this CPU is up to 50% faster. It doesn't look like amazing value up against Threadripper, but then again, Intel's HEDT lineup hasn't been that for some time anyway. However, you won't be able to purchase one of these CPUs off the shelf, at least for now. Intel are exclusively selling it to system integrators and OEMs, so if you want a 3175X, you'll have to buy an entire system. This isn't a bad idea considering you'd need to buy a special motherboard and cooler anyway, and it's really designed for professional workstations rather than enthusiasts, although that said, I think it probably will still disappoint a few people. Next, Intel story relates to their new F-series processors, which denote a CPU with a disabled iGPU. Intel announced these chips at CES a couple of weeks back, but did so without any firm pricing. Well, earlier this week, the chips have begun to appear in retail channels, including US retailer B&H Photo and Video. Oddly, the F-series chips are priced higher than the models with the iGPU enabled. The Core i9-9900KF, for example, was listed at $582.50, compared to just $530 for the i9-9900K. Similarly, the Core i7-9700KF was $452.50, compared to $410 for the 9700K, and the 9600KF at $308.75 versus $260 for the non-F model. This is likely because the F models are new and could be limited in stock. Intel's suggested retail price for the boxed versions of these processors is identical whether it's the F model or not. The 9900K, for example, is listed at $499, as is the 9900KF, although of course neither CPU is available at that price right now. That said, not sure how many F models they will actually sell if both are the same price. There isn't much of a reason to buy a 9900KF over a 9900K if both are the same price, as I guess we're not really expecting any performance differences. Another Intel story, this time relating to the Core i9-9900T. This CPU was spotted as an engineering sample on Yahoo Auctions, of all places. The, uh, the 9900T is basically a 9900K, except with a much harsher power limit. While the 9900K has a listed 95 watt TDP, the 9900T comes in at 35 watts, leading to a much lower clock speeds. It's still an 8-core 16-thread CPU, but instead of having a base clock of 3.6 GHz with a boost up to 5 GHz, the 9900T slots in with just a 1.7 GHz base and a boost of only 3.8 GHz. Intel typically releases a T-series of SKUs for low-power systems, those that either need to run at low levels of power consumption or are a small form factor and can't pack in enough cooling capacity for the fully-fledged chips. In these situations, having an 8-core CPU at lower clocks may be the best option Option. That said, there's still no official word about these SKUs just yet. 
Final Intel story is a quicker one. The company has named Robert Swan as CEO after a seven-month search. Swan has been Intel's CFO since 2016 and was also the interim CEO after Brian Krasanich left in June 2018. I don't really pay much attention to corporate structures of companies, so I don't have any other comments on this, but it seems like investors weren't super happy as stock prices took a bit of a dip after the announcement. Speaking of stock prices taking a dip after announcements, Nvidia this week drastically altered their Q4 revenue guidance. Originally, the company expected 2.7 billion in revenue from the fourth quarter, but now they've cut that by $500 million to just 2.2 billion. As a result, Nvidia stock price tanked by more than 12%. A combination of factors contributed to this drop in revenue. The cryptocurrency market is the first reason. Nvidia initially responded to a spike in demand by producing more Pascal GPUs, only to have demand then drop off when those GPUs were ready. This left Nvidia with an excess of inventory and were forced to delay a planned production ramp of several new products. The second issue was the launch of Turing in general. Lackluster reception for Nvidia's new GPUs, which Jensen partly blamed on a lack of RTX support in actual games, not that I think that was a real reason, uh, has led to lower than expected sales. Nvidia has also suggested uh, that gamers are waiting for price drops before buying. Although again, Nvidia really only have themselves to blame for that one as they were the ones that set the prices. Nvidia also blamed a decelerating global market, particularly in China, along with unpredictability in their data center business. With all of these factors combined, Nvidia is set to miss their original guidance by a significant amount, and that continues the company's struggles in the last half a year or so. AMD has amended their agreement with Global Foundries. This probably isn't the biggest news out there, but it's at least a little bit interesting. The basics are the new agreement sets out pricing and volumes for wafers AMD will purchase from Global Foundries through to 2021. Of course, we're not getting any public details about those prices or volumes, but those have been locked in. The good news for AMD is the new agreement allows AMD to purchase wafers at the seven nanometer node or smaller from other companies like TSMC or Samsung without one-time payments or royalties to Global Foundries. I'm not familiar with their previous agreement, but you'd think that when Global Foundries were still planning on releasing a 7 nanometer node, that their agreement with AMD would have prevented AMD from easily switching over to TSMC without some sort of payment. AMD will continue to use Global Foundries for products built on 12 nanometer nodes or larger, so this would include their Zen Plus CPUs and APUs that they'll continue to be selling, the IO die for new Zen 2 products, and most of their current GPU lineup. If AMD fail to meet their agreed upon annual wafer purchase amount, they'll have to pay a portion of the difference between their actual purchases and the target. Previously, AMD had to pay the full amount regardless of how many wafers they actually needed, so this is an improvement as well. In gaming news, I'm sure you've all heard about the controversy regarding Metro Exodus leaving Steam for the Epic Game Store. In case you haven't heard, Metro Exodus will now be sold exclusively through the Epic Game Store, although anyone who already pre-ordered through Steam will be able to download the game, updates and any further DLC as planned. The likely reason behind this is Epic offers a larger cut for developers and publishers than Steam, and this cut could be even better if they sign an exclusivity deal, at least I'm assuming. Uh, but the news angered a lot of gamers who understandably felt like the exclusivity was a bit of a shafting here uh, and the sudden switch as well seems to have rubbed people the wrong way. Old Metro games did get review bombed on Steam and there have been lots of complaints. Don't really have many thoughts on this. I'd personally prefer every game to be released on Steam because it has, in my opinion, the best functionality out of the game stores and launches and it's also where most of my library is but I also don't mind a bit of competition, I guess. That said, I think exclusivity deals probably aren't the best way to go about generating competition. A chemical issue at TSMC's Fab 14B has affected yields for some customers, including Nvidia, Huawei, and MediaTek. A photoresist chemical used in production deviated from specifications, and that caused lower than normal yields for recently processed wafers. TSMC says some shipments will have to be delayed into quarter two as a result, but doesn't know how much of a financial impact it will have at this stage. Final topic of this week, we now have confirmed specifications for Nvidia's mobile GeForce RTX series. The company officially launched these GPUs earlier this week alongside all new laptops. We should have a few reviews coming up soon, but the specs themselves are worth looking at. 
While the mobile RTX 2060, 2070, and 2080 all pack the same CUDA core counts and memory configurations as their desktop counterparts, clock speeds are lower across the board and have wide ranges in the case of some products. The RTX 2080, for example, is clocked at a 15-15 MHz base with a rated boost of 17-10 MHz on the desktop. But for laptops, the highest configuration of this GPU will top out at just a 1380 MHz base with a 1590 MHz boost. However, we could see some Max-Q variants clocked as low as a 735 MHz base and a 1095 MHz boost, which is quite low. That's a pretty huge range as well, with a similarly large range in TDPs. NVIDIA says 80 to 150 plus watts. Seems like there could be some noticeable differences between each RTX laptop, depending on the configuration here. It's a similar story for the RTX 2070. Desktop cards are clocked up to a 1620 MHz boost, while laptops top out at 1440 MHz, excluding GPU Boost 3.0, of course, which often pushes well above those rated speeds. The RTX 2060 as well, again, desktop cards clock up to 1680 MHz, but in laptops, we're facing just 1200 MHz clocks. It seems that NVIDIA have aggressively downclocked these GPUs to fit into certain TDP categories. For example, the RTX 2060 is up to a 90 watt part in laptops, whereas the desktop card is rated for 160 watts. With such a huge difference, uh, there's bound to be a large performance drop here, and it's the same for the other parts at 175 watts and 215 watts, which have been reduced to 115 watts and 150 watts respectively. In some ways, this does make sense as laptops, you know, they don't have the same cooling capabilities as desktop GPUs, and Turing cards aren't noticeably more efficient than Pascal cards that came before them. So realistically, there shouldn't be a large jump in performance that's available for a laptop with the same cooling power. But it's definitely disappointing that unlike with Pascal, where laptop GPUs were roughly on par with desktop equivalents, that Turing laptops will likely perform a bit slower than their desktop variants. We'll evaluate this in the coming weeks as our RTX laptop samples arrive. Anyway, that's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment, usually in Unirox every Friday, uh, assuming YouTube actually delivers it to people. Um, you can consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our exclusive Discord community and our monthly live streams. And I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>